Hello there and welcome to this guide to chapter 5 of The Woman in Black. So this is Across the Causeway and it's the chapter where Arthur goes across the causeway. Uh, it's also the first visit to Ilmarsh House. And it starts pretty much where the previous chapter leaves off. Uh, Arthur gets on a horse and cart. Uh, a pony and trap in this case, um, to go across the causeway to Eel Marsh House because the causeway is impassable by just about any other means, certainly a motor car, because apparently those things are a thing, because Mr. Bentley's got one. But a lot of people still seem to have ponies and traps. So, again, we're asking ourselves, kind of, when is this? And it gives us a, that sense of it's other it's some time ago but when exactly we never can be entirely sure there's even a telephone being used at some point so uh, again we've got a sense that it's a while ago but not quite sure when uh we get uh, a lot of conversation out of keckwick he seems he says virtually nothing um uh, i think he says 5 p.m to arthur's question about when the tides are when Arthur gets over that. What's significant though here is that this is the chapter that Arthur first lays eyes on Eel Marsh House and his reaction to Eel Marsh House is almost as visceral as his reaction to Monk's Peace. There's a clear connection between these two rural isolated houses and uh, we'll talk about that more in later videos and so certainly in retrospective videos. But here we see him seeing Eel Marsh House for the first time and seeming neat to fall in love with the place. It starts a little bit before that as he's crossing the marshes and, and he sees the the river estuary and the and the salt flats and the flood plains and the marshes and just finds them to be stunning to be beautiful um he arrives at the house dismisses keckwick because you know if you're gonna be at a haunted house you may as well be there on your own um he decides to explore the island and finds a graveyard Ooh, yeah um it, it's a classic gothic trope there's a tumble down chapel what once might even have been a monastery and a ruined graveyard and he experiences a preternatural or supernatural kind of uh event when he sees the woman with the wasted face the woman from the funeral in the graveyard uh he actually even describes it as though he nearly died uh then she disappears seemingly through a gap in the fence. But then it turns out that she's disappeared because Arthur follows her, as you do, um, and uh, finds out there was nowhere for her to go. So there we go. Dramatic, dramatic, dramatic. So now he panics, runs away. Good idea. To the house. Bad idea. So what we do, though, is we get a setup where Arthur then is able to go through the house. Uh, and the description of the house is interesting because at this stage, you'd expect it to be some dark and sinister place. And he finds it actually to be quite ordinary. Um, the house doesn't give us a sense that it is a uh, dangerous place for Arthur, although all logic dictates that it should be. It's the isolated house. It's the seemingly your classic haunted mansion um which you know we we later find out it actually you know it is um but it doesn't feel like that it feels like it was just a disused old house uh, and arthur then begins to kind of calm down and reflects on the environment he actually um recognizes the beauty of the house again kind of looks at the environment although now he's beginning to sense the loneliness and the isolation and the unusualness of the events drive him uh, to want to leave so um, a kind of inverse of the effect that it had, had on him initially where it drew him in at the end of the chapter we see arthur then takes the very sensible decision to set out alone and on foot across a causeway in uh in an environment he doesn't know uh which is prone to sea frets and as i say across a tidal causeway where the tide is likely to come in um you know, 
What could possibly go wrong? Quite a few things, and they do in the next chapter. But that's where we get to. So again, it's a chapter where, in terms of the number of events that occur, there's not a lot of things happen, but a lot of stuff occurs that is important, that we need to focus on, that we need to pay attention to. Uh, a lot of firsts occur in this chapter. Um, it's the first time we've seen our Marsh House. It's again, it's another encounter with the woman with the wasted face, the woman in black. And we know she's the woman in black because actually it's in this chapter she's first referred to like that. So techniques and things to note. So we get motifs being used. Now, motifs are symbols that appear repeatedly. Uh, they can be an image, sound, action, figure, object, something that represents something bigger or more than itself. And in this instance, we're going to look at the motif of birds. The birds we've already seen have some uh, metaphorical significance. Arthur described himself and Mr. Jerome as a pair of gloomy ravens. And now we have the introduction of this satanic looking bird. I, I, I genuinely, I mean, short of the bird having a pitchfork, uh, cloven hooves, a funny little tail and, you know, smelling distinctly of sulfur. I'm not quite sure how a bird can look satanic, but apparently this one does. And that very hyperbolic description is uh, indicative of the significance of that bird. Um, and then, of course, it flies off and comes back with a little wriggling fishy trapped in its beak. Hint. Terrible, horrible thing trapping a seemingly innocent thing as its prey. And it, it will consume it. Hint, Arthur. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I d again, Arthur has already been given these big neon signs that say don't. Uh, and here there's another one which he just doesn't notice. But again, the significance of it is likely to be more obvious to Arthur the narrator than it is to Arthur the character. And again, we have to remember there's a distinct separation between the two. Yeah, but, you know, bird equal woman in black, fish equal Arthur. So, and then we've also got the pony and trap, the motif of the pony and trap, which comes right the way throughout the novel. Um, it's already kind of occurred at the very beginning when Arthur was out in the, 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 the pony cart with Mr. Bentley in, but that was a reminiscence of an event sort of many years after this particular sequence occurs. But the, the, the pony carts, uh, the pony and traps do represent a something. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because if you haven't read the later chapters, but they are significant. They, um, they have a great deal of meaning. They represent a sort of, they represent a change. They do represent things altering. And that's all I'll say on that for the moment. So do pay attention to it, though. This the pony and trap is here. It takes Arthur from one place to another, and it literally transports him from one kind of reality to a different kind of reality. There's some interesting use of descriptive language. I mean, there's always interesting use of descriptive language with um, Susan Hill, but this one in particular is is really important. If you need to go back and have a look at some of the early descriptions of Arthur's journey to Eel Marsh House. The language she uses is incredibly emotive, incredibly descriptive, almost hyperbolic. Arthur himself is, is really effusive about just how beautiful the landscape is. It's described as shining and silver and, and you know, it, it, it feels beautiful to us as readers. And the rhythm of the language and the pace of it feels almost hypnotic. Uh, Arthur is kind of almost mesmer. Well, I mean, not kind of, he, he kind of actually at various stages drops into a kind of a different level of consciousness. Um, and this instance here, it's, he's drawn into it by, by the, the environment, it, it seems to affect him in a very profound way. Personification, uh, it's one of a handful of techniques that uh, is scattered throughout this novel. And this one is uh, used to personify the house. It's a subtle use of personification. Eel Marsh House is described using two adjectives, which are quite intriguing, gaunt and handsome, both not 
they're not exclusively used to describe people, but they are more commonly used to describe people. So these are not words you would normally use on buildings. You, don't, you almost never would describe a building as gaunt. I don't think I've ever, outside of this description here, ever heard of a building being described as a gaunt looking building. That's something you would talk about for, for a person, describe their face being drawn and thin, being gaunt. Um, gaunt implies that weight has been lost and, and I, I, that seems unlikely with a building unless what they mean is that some of it's fallen off in which case gaunt wouldn't be the adjective you'd reach for so it's an unusual description um a house is kind of given this sinister personality of its own in the same description we see um il marsh has described as almost rising out of the sea as if it's it's active and it's acting uh, almost like a kind of godzilla like monsters you know coming out of the sea waiting to greet arthur um and the lexical choices that go with this in particular this description are really important uh il Mosh has is described uh in parallel to other buildings all buildings that stand alone in coastal locations but each one of these buildings is designed to have a specific purpose and those specific purposes are not great ones because the, the beacons and the lighthouse is a warning stay away from here and the martello tower is a defensive fortification again giving a real sense of get away don't come here you are not welcome all of these buildings are really staying stay away from this location so let's have a look at a few key quotations so here's this quotation to illustrate the point i was making about um very long section where Arthur is driving, is being driven in the pony cart across the countryside around Eel Marsh House. This is a, 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 a really powerfully emotive piece of writing. His heart literally begins to race. I would have traveled a thousand miles to see this. I would never would have imagined such a place. This place is having a huge effect. And it, and it really is referencing that, like that Gothic idea of the sublime, the idea that powerful strong emotions not just specifically positive ones but overwhelming ones um can hit a person and take over their experience this was a real focus of um in some instances romantic literature but in gothic literature the idea of the sublime is often linked with a powerful negative experience but also a powerful it can be a very powerfully positive experience here of course it's we know it's going to be both um more negative ultimately but it starts to feel here like a really power you know a really powerful positive emotion an overwhelming almost supernatural uh, flow of powerful emotions through the body which is exactly what arthur is experiencing ah yes She's back again with the foreshadowing. Yeah, here we have, I realized that this must be the non nose Causeway and saw how quickly it would become quite submerged and untraceable. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, definitely. That's a clue. That's definitely a clue. Because, of course, that's going to happen. We know that. We know that. We knew that from the moment we were saying it was across a tidal causeway. We knew he's going to get trapped. We knew the tide is going to cause problems. And yet here he is going across the causeway. Another example here, interesting quotation, where we see that the, the effect of the house, uh, the power that it's had on him. Uh, and at this stage, Arthur is in a lot of trouble. The parallel I would draw is it's almost like um, it's like a pitcher plant. Those flowers with the, the um, well, they're shaped like pictures, like a kind of a jug. And they have, at the bottom of them, they have a, a sweet, sugary liquid. Uh, but it's also a powerful neurotoxin. And the creatures that are attracted to that, flies, etc., fall into there and then drift to the bottom and are slowly digested. You know, they, they put out something sweet to attract their prey and trap them. And they can't get back out of this picture because it's it's uh, unclimbable. The the edges of it um, are too slick for the insects to get out of, and they're overcome by the uh, the poisonous fumes, and they drift down to the bottom of this poisonous digestive goop and are eaten. You know, this is what's happening to Arthur. Metaphorically speaking, he is drawn in. Um, he starts fantasizing about living at Eel Marsh House. 
now here we go. I began to speculate about living here. I mean, that is weird. He is, I, I mean, from the point of view, the fact that he's here because an old woman has just died and he's dealing with the will. And now he's going, oh, this would be a good place to live. Uh, uh, too soon? Definitely. Too weird and isolated? Without a doubt. The fact that the locals don't even talk about this place, I mean, come on. Also, it's a real key hint that he talks about Stella. And we all know Stella is not at the end of this story. She doesn't feature in the Arthur, the narrator's life. Certainly not at his time at Monk's Peace. So, again, there's more stuff to, to focus on there. Uh, yeah, coming back to this, the ugly satanic looking thing, like some species of sea vulture, if such a thing existed, they, they, they don't. And certainly not in the UK that I'm aware of. Um, and again, unpleasant snake, necked bird, hooked around a fish that rides healthily. So here it is, huge hint. Um, and Arthur doesn't pay any attention. Mm, no. Pay attention, Arthur. No, no, no. No. Okay. So as is typical, Arthur doesn't even spot this coming. And finally... This is a quotation you absolutely need to hone in on. And if you've got your own copies of the novel, highlight this, put a bookmark in it. It's really important. It's in this chapter that we see the word, there was no sign at all of the woman in black. That's the first time those words are used in that order in this book, except for on the front cover and in perhaps the list of the chapter titles. Okay, but once we're into the narrative, this here, about halfway through, is the first time we see that word, that phrase used. Now, at the minute, it's still being used as a noun phrase, as opposed to a proper noun. But there it is, the first time the woman in black is mentioned. And we know that we've hit a turning point. We know that the moment Arthur has seen her for the second time, we kind of get the impression that prior to this point, maybe... Maybe there's a chance if Arthur hadn't gone over the causeway to Eel Marsh House, he'd have probably been all right. He could have gotten away with it, possibly. But now he's been there, now he's experienced this, and the stuff that happens in the next chapter. Well, from here on in, we know that it doesn't end well. I mean, we already know it doesn't end well because of the way the story is narrated. The frame narrative indicates that there was a series of terrible events. But at this stage, and this is the skill of um, Susan Hill, just as Shakespeare does with Romeo and Juliet, we know from the outset what occurs to Romeo and Juliet, yet we still go with them on the journey, hoping that they'll make the right decision, which is illogical because their decision is set in stone. Same thing is true here. Here we are thinking, oh God, Arthur, don't, oh no. And then the moment that that phrase is out, would be included into the fact that a turning point has been hit. The woman in black is now a thing and Arthur is in a lot of trouble. Okay, so there you go. Chapter five, really pivotal, lots to focus on. Thank you very much.